All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sir JJ. And thank you, Sir Ralph. Ah, Sir Ralph, yeah. Uh, for, ano, for that uh, brief but very comprehensive overview uh, of AI and machine learning. So for my part, uh, I'll be talking about the legal risks inherent in AI uh, and mostly in implementing AI tools and other AI use cases. So uh, I believe Ralph already gave a brief description as to what AI is and as to what machine learning is. But just to contextualize this uh, presentation further, and I mean, as most of you would know, like lawyers are suckers for definition. So just to put in some context, uh, what is machine learning? So it could be summarized uh, as the ability of a machine or a computer to mod modify its programming uh, on the basis of inputs or on the basis of data that it would be consuming. So uh, that's important in understanding how AI is used in a lot of uh, applications. So um, in understanding legal risks, we should note that AI can't be considered alone uh, or as an independent concept. So uh, its importance and also its ability to 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 spur further growth and innovation lies in uh, how it interacts with other technologies, as how Ralph uh, described it in his presentation. So uh, you could see the application, the interaction of AI and the and various IoT devices, mobile devices, uh, and yeah, it's important to consider AI in the context of the entire tech ecosystem where it uh, where it acts and. Um, just to give further examples, so like for example, um, the application of AI with mobile devices, right? So this could be in like navigation systems like Waze or Google Google Maps, or as mentioned a while ago, in the recommendation systems of Netflix or Spotify, where it generates uh, a set of recommendations based on your previous usage of of, of the application. And then also recently, uh, there was this new technology from Microsoft on image captioning, where it seeks to help uh, blind people to understand their environment. So for example, there's a dog, the advice would say there's a dog, etc. So it seems harmless enough, but if you push it further and understand how AI is applied in other industries, you'd see how it could expose individuals uh, and persons to certain risks or certain uh, certain harms. So for example, in insurance, uh, there's this one article I found where AI is used in designing products uh, for individuals based on information gathered from IoT devices. So, or I IoT sensors, so for example, your applications in your phone or your other wearable technology. And then insurance companies could come up with usage-based insurance. And presumably, uh, the amount of premiums that you need to pay and their assessment of the risk they're taking it by insuring you would be based on the volumes of data already collected from other devices. Uh, of course, it, 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 in, it in a way enhances customer experience by giving increased personalization, the same way that Netflix does it or Spotify does it. Uh, but as you could see, it comes at a uh, at a cost. And then also, I think this is like in the United States, they've been implementing AI in their criminal justice system. So uh, I understand that their uh, police force have been using AI systems in order to determine where they should, for example, send uh, members of their ranks because there are uh, there might be a greater propensity for crime in a certain area, etc. Uh, but I think the more impactful one would be how the judicial system is implementing a AI uh, when a judge makes a decision about a certain case. So how do they do it? Uh, basically, if there's a defendant, the AI tool would uh, take in a bunch of data about that individual, so educational background, uh, past encounters with the law, age, uh, address, etc. And then based on those inputs, the AI would come up with a score on the propensity or the possibility that that defendant would commit another crime. 
So, yung possibility for recidivism. And the judge would take that in along with other factors uh, when making uh, the final verdict. So, those are more parang harmful applications of AI. And then now, uh, as lawyers, I guess the next question would be, how should liability be established uh, with regards to decisions made based on AI or with regards to harm caused by AI? And who is responsible ultimately for uh, AI? So there are certain, uh, certain ways by which legal scholars and lawyers have viewed or have presented uh, or have analyzed AI in terms of liability. Basically, they here are the options. So AI as property, AI as semi-autonomous beings, or AI as autonomous entities. So the last one that's closer to the Terminator example presented by Ralph earlier. So AI as property. Uh, basically, when you treat AI as property, you'd be applying existing rules on liability or on torts uh, to AI. And generally, the rule there is the owner of the property would be responsible for all damages result resulting from that property. So for example, uh, building owners, uh, manufacturers of products, etc. And then the law right now, I think in a bunch of jurisdictions already, uh, provides a mechanism by which the proprietors would be able to shift liability eventually to the engineers or to the manufacturers. So in this concept, we see uh, the application of traditional legal concepts to a technology that's continuously evolving and some issues, right? When you apply this legal framework to AI, uh, we see that it's not that straightforward. Uh, as you would have gleaned from the presentation earlier, the creation of or the development of AI involves not just the owner of let's say the soft the software itself or the tool itself uh, but it also the way that it works would be attributable uh, in the programmer and also the trainer that inputs the data trains it further etc so now the question is how do you designate or distribute liability among everyone involved in the creation of ai and then another another proposal is to see is to, to view AI as a semi-autonomous being. So the same way that the law treats minors or children, students, and employees. Uh, and basically, you look at AI as, uh, yeah, as a minor. So any harm or any damage caused by the AI should be the responsibility of the parent or the guardian. Or yeah, if, if, if the AI did something harmful, then the owner of that AI should be answerable or should be able to compensate for the damages brought by uh, the AI. And then last is uh, the concept of looking at AI as autonomous beings. So basically this says that uh, you could consider AI as having its own distinct legal personality, seem similar to corporations. And the main argument for this, although I think technologically we're not yet there, uh, the main argument for this is AI, if it continuously develops or how it's acting now, arguably could be, could be said to be intelligent enough to make its own decisions. However, uh, that argument is a bit problematic. Because, like, for example, uh, what's that movie? Uh, Yung May Savant Syndrome. Siya. So, they, I forget the title. But the character there would have uh, an IQ of, I think, like a crazy, crazy high level of IQ, uh, definitely intelligent. However, the law still treats people with that syndrome as uh, someone with no legal capacity. So the fact that an AI could reach levels of intelligence that humans couldn't do uh, is not sufficient to argue that it should have its own legal, legal uh, personality. And as I think just to summarize, I think the, the main legal issues when it comes to AI is how to manage liability in case of harm, how to identify responsibility and accountability. And, and uh, of course, we can, argue, we can argue that the 
traditional concepts of tort and quasi delict would apply. But it's not that easy to identify, for example, whether the AI is the proximate cause of the harm. Or, like for example, with machine learning, uh, could you really say that the developer of the AI is at fault when the, for example, the licensee or the user was responsible for inputting messy data or harmful data into the AI and therefore arguably you can say that the data was the cause of the harm. So for example, there was this chatbot developed by uh, I think Microsoft and then they deployed it. Eventually the, the chatbot started to say like racist things and harmful things. And the explanation was it started to gather data from Twitter and eventually on it led to a racist chatbot. So some approaches. Uh, one legal scholar, uh, si Lawrence Lessig, proposed that in order to manage the risks posed by AI is that you build legal barriers or you build the rules that you want into the code of the AI. So it sees programmers and coders as legislators and rule makers. And at the point of coding, pa lang, the programmer should ensure that all applicable law and regulations are already considered. Uh, so, sure, that's fine. Uh, nga, I think this is where Isaac Asimov's law of robotics could come into play. I think this is always the question, like, for example, for automated vehicles, self driven vehicles, right? Uh, if a vehicle has to choose between uh, hitting another car sa road with a human being uh, inside that other car or going to the sidewalk and hitting a pedestrian, what would it do? Uh, so, anyway, I guess by incorporating itong laws ni Isaac Asimov uh, in his fictional books, arguably, you could uh, create an AI that will not harm human beings. Uh, ayun. However, this proposal is only feasible for AIs that don't do machine learning or don't, uh, yeah, that don't do machine learning. So, <clears throat> as, as we've seen in, in Ralph's presentation, the ability of AIs to really uh, provide greater efficiencies when it comes to business processes, etc., lies in its ability to reprogram itself when it gathers more data. And so the initial code set by the programmers could easily be disregarded uh, and new ones will be programmed into it. And then as the AI gathers more and more data, this would also uh, raise the issue of opacity or the algorithms of that AI tool being some sort of black box to the point that it becomes less and less understandable that a human being couldn't figure out or explain why it would why it would uh, why it would make certain decisions so these issues must eventually be figured out uh, if you want to build trust into the AI system and I think right now where we're at really is uh, we look at AI in the as lawyers as property so the normal rules on product liability would attach on negligence and on data privacy. And actually, there are certain regulations that, ha certain jurisdictions that have already uh, issued their own guidelines when it comes to AI implementation. So just for purposes of this presentation, uh, th these are the rules issued by the European Commission when it comes to AI implementation in their jurisdiction. And it's consistent with the proposal to look at AI as property. And I believe Singapore also issued its own guidelines for the use of AI when it comes to financial products. Here in the Philippines, we don't have any AI-specific regulations yet. But I understand that the DTI is coming up with its own guidelines when it comes to uh, AI vis-a-vis -vis consumer protection. So anyway, back to this one. Uh, in this proposal, which I think makes sense, and it's consistent with our current regulations. Uh, it says that a person operating technology that poses increased risk uh, of harm to others should be subject of strict liability for damages result resulting from its operation. So, and then it also says that a person using 
uh, technology that does not immediately pose an increased risk of harm to others should still be required to abide with some set of rules or some codes of conduct. And that if it's proven that they breach those rules or those set of guidelines, then they should be liable for breach for failing to follow those rules. So this would be relevant, for example, if you're a software company that develops AI, best practice would be for you to come up with your minimum set of standards for your trainers, for your programmers that they should follow. Uh, and in the event that they don't follow that, you should be able to go back to them for breach. And so some other proposals from the EU. The destruction of the victim's data should be, should be regarded as damage that's compensable. And then lastly, uh, in response to the proposals that AI should be viewed as an autonomous system, it says that it's not necessary to, necessary to do that, as the harms that these uh, technologies may cause can and should be attributable to existing persons or bodies, which ultimately would be the programmers and the owners of those uh, development companies. And just to bring it back home, uh, when looking at AI tools or developing AI tools, uh, it should be noted that these existing regulations would still apply. So like, for example, let's say for data privacy, um, the development of AI tools, uh, as has been repeatedly said, would depend on the data that you input into it in order to train it to come up with decisions. So for example, for uh, for the ability, uh, for self-driving vehicles, right? It should have the ability to recognize cars. So how do you train that uh, tool to do that? Essentially just uh, you put in a lot of images of cars on streets and then hopefully uh, input enough data that it would, it would learn it enough uh, to be able to drive on actual roads. So, so now that's for cars, but let's say you do you train the uh, you train uh, you train an AI tool to do let's say uh, recognize faces. Ayan. So the same thing. You input a bunch of photos so that the tool can can recognize a face when it sees one. And then in the process of doing that, you will need to process or you will need to collect a bunch of photos and personal information from individuals. So when you do that training, you should always be uh, you should always consider whether you're violating the Data Privacy Act, whether you're getting personal information without consent, and if it's possible, maybe it's not possible for facial recognition, but for some other AI tools, if you could just anonymize the training data that you get, then that would be better and you won't be, uh, you won't be under the coverage of the Data Privacy Act. But so, so stuff like that you have to uh, consider. And, uh, so anyway, managing risks and building trust in AI. Um, I think the AI community has been very active in coming up with best practices and guidelines in building ethical AI and building trust in AI. And <clears throat> ayun, these are some of the concepts that uh, the AI, there's a consensus that the AI com community has been pushing for. So th there should be responsibility when it comes to AI. The the end user or the consumer should know who to approach when things go wrong and there should be remediation for that. Uh, the AI should have some element of explainability, uh, meaning the operator should be able to explain how the AI works, how it comes up with decisions without resorting to uh, technical or very academic terms. Accuracy, meaning it's the operator is able to identify sources of error. Auditability, third parties can check and criticize. And I think this is important in order to prevent bias when it comes to uh, AI training, et cetera. Uh, and fairness, that it would uh, consider different demographics. So, yeah. uh, so I think moving forward, what's the point? I think uh, the point is to not stop AI from developing further, not over-regulate it. Uh, in terms of managing risks, it would be, it should be considered that uh, codes of conduct and baseline rules should be followed by programmers and trainers. There should be standards for data inputs to avoid uh, bias, uh, privacy issues, etc. 
And then, yun, I think the main point is to build trust in order to encourage greater use and further innovation. So, thank you.